Scott, uh, again, got his PhD at UNC. Uh, he's been teaching at uh, William and Mary, where he's the uh, Leslie and Naomi Lagoon. Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, professor of history. Uh, Scott's written uh, a number of books, Iron Confederacy, one of the favorite, my favorite books, Steel Driving Man, which uh, on John Henry, which I think is just a, a, a total masterpiece uh, and a, a great book for, uh, for students. And his uh, latest book is A Nation of Deadbeats, An Uncommon History of America's Financial Disasters. Uh, and he's been writing a, a lot on economic history, and I think he can tell you a little bit more about some of the stuff that, that he's got in the work. But he's going to talk to us today about uh, the white whale, why Moby Dick is a story about the fate of Southern labor in the age of slavery. So uh, welcome, Scott Nelson. To, uh, uh, thanks, Bob, and uh, thanks, uh, Beth, for, uh, and uh, thanks, Bob, and Beth, both for uh, organizing this video. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Southern labor and, and the story of the white whale. It's, it's a kind of, uh, I, I, when I first started thinking about uh, Moby Dick again in the context of Andrew Jackson and Melville's own life as I was uh, researching the Deadbeats book, I was struck by the ways in which Moby Dick made a lot more sense to me uh, in, the, in the wake of um, thinking about the South in the 1830s, and I um, did lose everything here. Uh, and it, 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 but I was talking to a friend of mine who was a professor in American Studies, and he said never, uh, the, the never try to figure out who the white whale is because that's ruined. Uh, the careers of at least a dozen students <laughs> in American studies. It, it's people go after the white whale and just like Ahab, they, uh, it ruins them, it destroys them, they never, never get their dissertations done. So uh, everybody wants to explain what the white whale is, but no one can, can do it. So I'm, I'm going to do this by, in fact, uh, it's, 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 it was always more closely connected to OSEX than uh, Southern Industrialization, the sort of Southern economy, culture, and society of the 18 teens through the 30s, and how it helps us understand uh, Moby Dick uh, very differently. I want to talk about two books, actually. The first is a novel about consumer debt, uh, wrapped up in a book that a few people have heard of, Charlie Briggs's The Adventures of Harry Franco. I think it captures, uh, help us understand Andrew Jackson in particular. We're not used to thinking about consumer debt before the age of the credit card, but consumer debt is ancient, and consumer debt allowed white settlers to conquer the Northwest and white slaveholders to use enslaved settlers to settle the Southwest. The first U.S. institution to arrive in the West was not the squatter shack, the army barrack, or the hunter's cabin, but the American store, related to but slightly different from the British colonial store uh, that was established with Scottish shopkeepers uh, in the 18th century in Virginia. The first storekeepers traded with Indians, their shops marking the Indian frontier. But soon, funded by merchant capitalists, these store owners provisioned settlers and slaves in the South. They provided soap, sugar, thread, and cork, but also linen, osnabergs, woolens, and calico. They, they, in the 1770s, they took in furs, tobacco, and either wheat or flour. Young men on the make, like the young Andrew Jackson, owned stores like this in the backcountry. After the revolution, would-be storekeepers came to revisioning cities like New York uh, City, Boston, and Philadelphia to meet with jobbers, the next uh, link in this chain. A jobber, Andrew Jackson did this in Philadelphia in 1795, where he received credit for wholesalers uh, in linens, woolens, and calicos for goods he would bring back to his stores in Tennessee. A well-known jobber of New York City, famous for cheap half-finished jackets, was David Brooks and his brother Henry, these Brooks brothers accepted promissory notes uh, from young would-be operators like Jackson. Another jobber who proved, uh, provided mostly fancy clothing, bows, straps, and galloons. Well, I don't know what a galloon is, uh, but it's, it's, no, it's, a, it's a piece of fabric that's uh, put around a hat, was Alan Melville, Herman Melville's father. Country store operators uh, in the South, uh, like Andrew Jackson, sought out credit from these New York jobbers like Melville. And he, in turn, uh, that is, Jackson, in turn, provided credit to farmers and slaveholders in the two stores that he operated in Tennessee. 
Andrew Jackson's misunderstanding about a note he signed in 1795 almost bankrupted him. He became thereafter obsessed with his credit, his reputation, and bore grievances against the merchant princes like the Melvilles ever afterwards. We can't reconstruct precisely what happened to Andrew Jackson in 1795, but that novel that I first mentioned is the best way, I think, to get, uh, help us understand what happened. The novel's about the tricks of the trade in, uh, in, in, on the East Coast. In the early 18th, uh, 19th century, this novel, uh, published in 1839, but set in New York uh, decades earlier, is derived from uh, Briggs's own father's failure in the 18-teens. In it, the hero, he's always called the hero throughout the book, leaves his rural home a day's ride from the steamboat landing on the Hudson. And the novel's a picaresque, alternating between satire and comedy. The central drama comes from the injuries of class. Dispossessed of his fortune, the hero has to put up with ridicule from his cousins for his poverty, in particular for the sorry state of his cheap jacket. And his father gives the hero a small roll of bank bills for the last of the family's money, so that he become a clerk in a counting house in the city. Uh, we know from the beginning that, that because he was raised by his mother, and because his mother read too many novels, that the hero is going to get fleeced by the wolves of New York. How the hero gets fleeced is the rest of the story. The hero, uh, like Andrew Jackson, is quickly set upon by a fast-talking young man with a lilac shirt and a satinette vest named Mr. Lummox. Uh, and Lummox, uh, at this time, is a, a lazy person who gives him a card and promises a fortune if he goes to J. Smith Davis and Company, dry goods jobber. The hero first goes to an auction house and he's confused by the fast talking and the quick bidding and inadvertently throws away the family fortune on a small casket, basically a little box that contains useless trinkets. The hero then is lured into, by Mr. Lummox into a lobby in the city hotel where he drinks too many sweetened alcoholic drinks and passes out, then to a bowery theater filled with painted ladies, and then a house of prostitution with, quote, half a dozen yellow women, unquote. And finally, to Mr. Smith Davis's shop, in Hanover Square, where he's enjoined to buy goods on credit. Lummox, it turns out, is a drummer for a jobber. A drummer is a person who ingratiates himself with country merchants, introduces these men to all the sins of the city, and persuades them to borrow huge sums uh, from the jobbers for linens and calicoes. And country merchants have been obliged to sell these overpriced goods in their own stores in the country, all on long credit. The hero narrowly escapes his fate by having too few uh, the, uh, references. The adventure at the heart of the novel is the trap that Jobber set for country merchants. It was, as far as we could tell, very much like the trap that Andrew Jackson fell in in 1795. It was one of, that Briggs well understood, having been himself a merchant in Nantucket. Jackson, 28 years old in 1795, fell in with a drummer named David Allison, and Allison gave Jackson credit, but also bought land that Jackson had claimed but not paid for using letters of credit. Jackson used the letters of credit to pay for dry goods. He needed to set up his first store in the Cumberland River. Jackson signed underneath Allison's notes. At 28, he didn't realize this meant that he was liable if, Al if Allison didn't pay the notes. And that's precisely what happened. When Allison failed in 1796, Jackson wrote that it, quote, placed me in the damnedest position every man was placed in, unquote. Forced to sell his store, his goods, and most of his land to pay his debts in 1796, Jackson only escaped debtor's prison by swearing a bond guaranteeing to cover all of Allison's failures with a maximum penalty, with a penalty of $100,000. The Adventures of Harry Franco doesn't just show us the dangers of the English consumer credit chain that stretched to stores in Tennessee, not just the dangers, but also its possibilities. English manufacturers sent goods to New York, Philadelphia, and Boston across the Atlantic. These goods were sold at auction houses where the hero mistakenly bought the useless trinkets. Each auction house in New York partnered with a bank, which accepted promissory notes from buyers. The bank collected on the note and charged interest. And this is really the beginnings of the banks of New York, is this connection to the jobbers. Jobbers bought the goods at auction to quickly sell them to country merchants, also on credit. And the country merchants, like Jackson, took the goods into the country to sell them to farmers and settlers on credit. In each case, the credit agency, so to speak, was the gaze of the last lender. Who is this man in my shop? Is he, in the phrase of the day, as good as wheat? Will he pay his debts? Who will vouch for him? This is the male world of the gaze men's gaze at one another that shapes credit. This emphasis on the costume and the display of a certain class of men in the South is so important that it continues to today. The green corduroy pants, boat shoes, and bow ties of the modern Southern gentleman is in some ways a disturbing 21st century version, <laughs> incarnation of that uh, concern with capital, credit, and appearance. Uh, 
a southern man is not afraid of color. I was, I, I was told recently by a certain kind of well-to-do southern. The novel is obsessed with men's views of other men. And the turn of the frock coat, the mud on the boots, the sweat on the forehead are all the markers by which men thought they could gauge each other's credit. The author, a thorough racist, anti-Semite, and reactionary, nonetheless also recognizes that this whole process of consumer credit is surrounded by the labors of those workers who are excluded from that credit. The black bellmen, the yellow prostitutes, and the white women, uh, mostly widows, who provide rooms for visiting merchants as well as food, clean linens, and toilet facilities. Indeed, the presence of slavery and unpaid and underpaid domestic labor is all-encompassing, makes this whole process work. There are two economies here, though, two chains of credit. One is the consumer credit that goes out to the countryside that makes it possible for people to settle in places like Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana. Um, uh, and uh, and that's, a, that's a world where credit-worthy white men and the rest of those without. The linens, Osnabergs, and woolens are goods that women or servants will sew to build up the man who will then borrow again. It's difficult to underestimate how important loans of inexpensive consumer goods were in allowing the settlement of the Southwest. They provided covering and civilization, allowing farm families and slave-owning families to function in ways that are difficult for us to imagine, surrounded as we are by cheap clothing. Um, a well-made and fitted winter jacket in the 1790s was the price of a small house. Very expensive. Clothing is very expensive. The single biggest thing that working people had in the 19th century, single most important and valuable thing. Most clothing marked your class, but it also was a physical embodiment of your class. Until the 1870s, clothing was the most valuable thing that most people in the world owned. This entire credit edifice came tumbling down in the Panic of 1819. The end of 1818, Britain imposed tariffs on the flour that the US exported to the islands of the British Caribbean. And when that happened, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, all of which exported flour to those slave regimes, collapsed. When farmers could not sell their wheat to the millers of the coastal city, they could not pay for the consumer goods they had borrowed from stores. Store operators halted payments to jobbers. Jobbers and millers halted payments to banks. Banks halted payments to English manufacturers. And this was the panic of 1819. Out of this panic, a new commodity would emerge that would reshape the South. To replace wheat and flour, the biggest American exports until then. That new commodity was cotton. Cotton begins in the 1770s, but it doesn't beat wheat and flour until after 1819. It had been a small export, mostly from coastal South Carolina and Alabama, and cotton would spur a credit boom in the old Southwest between 1820 and 1837 that would remake the South and remake Southern labor. Consumer credit was important here, too. The boxes of cotton cloth were manufactured in Manchester. Square boxes of cotton cloth left Manchester for Liverpool, and then onto the English ships that sold on credit to English-owned agency houses and stores all over the British Empire, from South Africa to India to Hong Kong. That consumer credit, as uh, Sven Beckert has most recently shown, built the British Empire. The producing chain built by the labor of slaves <coughs> is what changed the South. Andrew Jackson presided over this credit boom, and in fact, he made it possible. Indeed, he made it happen with a series of military forays from New Orleans to Florida. Then by demanding and enforcing Indian removal as a president. And finally by creating an agreement between the president and the king of England that guaranteed that American ships and British ships would be treated equally in uh, each other's ports. This uh, agreement of 1830 shows up in no uh, 21st or 20th century history of Andrew Jackson, but the most important thing, uh, one of the most important uh, pieces of Jackson's um, act act activities. Uh, it's discussed in much, much older books, but not uh, currently. This agreement of 1830. So it's, it's basically the, the TPP of the East Coast, uh, really. It, it basically is free trade, effectively free trade. Not, it's not that there are tariffs, but the fact that the ships are treated equally on either side uh, broke the old system of mutually <coughs> punitive inspections of Anglo-American ships under Madison, Monroe, and Adams. Uh, Jackson's agreement with England cheapened transatlantic traveling, uh, travel leading to a doubling of Anglo-American trade in Jackson's term. The American clipper ship was the most famous product of this uh, direct competition between British and American ships. The other product of this boom, of course, was the internal slave trade. This new bank credit was available for cotton that was not uh, enough or long-term enough to allow a white person to buy slaves if he did not or she, she did not own them. But uh, it was enough for a slaveholder who already owned at least eight slaves to buy one or two more. 
the labor of eight or nine slaves in a single season could then pay the purchase price of that extra slave. And so what it does is it leads to further inequality in the deep south compared to the rest of the south. So it doesn't make, provide an opportunity. The credit, the, that very short-term credit, means that only people who are already established as cotton planters can become more and more important as planters. That means many, many more slaves being brought uh, down but on, onto large plantations and not small. <coughs> this short-term credit could uh, fund slave traders who transplanted slaves down the river to Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. The short-term nature of the credit, roughly 90 days plus transportation, is what Karl Marx called merchant capital. The short-term credit meant that only relatively large slaveholders could borrow and pay back in 90 days. A single American institution, the second bank of the United States, sought to dominate these mostly private chains of credit for cotton. Chartered by the federal government um, after the War of 1812, the bank, presided over by Nicholas Biddle, created private promissory notes called post notes that traded without a discount throughout the South and, and throughout the U.S. It became the premier saltwater bank of the 19th century. Critics called it the Hydra, the Monster, the Leviathan, the Whale. Jackson, not surprisingly, was suspicious of this bank and believed that its offices should be part of the treasury. Nicholas Biddle, concerned about Jackson's actions, found a way to reach one of Jackson's most famous supporters, most important supporters, James Watson Webb, the editor of the New York Courier and Inquirer, paper with the largest circulation in the United States. It was a sort of Fox News of the 19th century. The bank gave Webb a loan in March of 1831. A week later, Webb changed sides, endorsing a recharter of the bank against Jackson's wishes. A congressional committee the next year proved that the bank had indeed bribed numerous newspapers in exchange for support. The merchant, Alan Melville, uh, Herman Melville's father, lost out to this new sort of trade, never quite understanding how the easy credit of the U.S. bank had allowed others to underprice him. This whole system of jobbers and country store merchants was something that Alan Melville couldn't really get his head around, this, this uh, system of, of long-term and long-distance credit. Alan Melville's failure in 1830 foreclosed his son Herman's chance for a regular education. Herman then became a minor functionary for the New York State Bank in Albany, a scrivener a bank closely connected to the Albany Regency, which had supported Andrew Jackson, the New York faction that had supported Andrew Jackson. The Regency, the Albany Regency, were soft money Democrats committed to an expansive money supply who saw Jackson as their best chance of success. Herman's brother Gonsworth invested what was less of the family's fortune in the booming trade of the 1830s. Gonsworth was certain that the family would succeed, uh, as many others had who were connected with Jackson. But in July of 1836, Jackson's war against the bank reached its pinnacle. Jackson passed a specie circular which required land payments to be made in coin or land scrap, not banknotes, not post notes of Biddle's bank. As Senator William Campbell of South Carolina put it, Jackson's war against the bank was destroying the country. The hunter, keen for sport or impatient for revenge, this is Jackson, hurls his dart and rushes upon the dying beast, winding his horn, calling up his huntsman, and unkettling his pack. The ebbing energies of the lion are aroused to a new effort of flight, and if in the chase our cornfields are trampled upon and our flocks scattered, it may be sport to the mighty hunter, but it is desolation to the country through which the chase sweeps. As Jessica Lepler has recently shown, Jackson and the Bank of England both raised questions about this commodity chain uh, in which British banks lent to American firms on future cotton. Interest rates spiked in 1837, making it impossible for borrowers to renew their loans. Farms were abandoned, rope walks and mills shuttered, unemployment rates soared, and thousands of defaulting Southerners crossed into the independent Republic of Texas, where they would be safe uh, from the seizure of their debts, uh, and the seizure of their slaves. When the panic hit Albany in May of 1837, Gunsworth's mother pledged what was left of Herman Melville's inheritance to cover Gunsworth's debts. Herman's uncle, also bankrupted, ran off to Illinois, abandoning the family estate in the Berkshires. Now jobless, Herman returned to the estate while the family scrambled to pay the back taxes. Wandering around the old mansion, examining the peeling wallpaper, he reflected on the fate of his once proud and wealthy family, humbled once in 1830 when his father failed, and again in 1837 when his uncle failed. After working for a few years as a tutor, he left New York for a life at sea. Years later, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, an older Herman Melville reflected on the course of his life in a story that he admitted was partly allegorical. He called it the whale. It was the story of Ishmael, a simple sailor from an old established family who signs on board a whaling ship 
led by a crazy Captain Ahab. A driven man with a long scar on his face, the captain had a personality that inspired in Ishmael, quote, a wild, sympathetical, mystical feeling. <clears throat> the long scar is a source of Ahab's rage, much like the scar that Andrew Jackson received from an English officer in his youth. Among the Democratic crew that works for Ahab and the New York bankers who support him, few fully understand his reckless plan. Quote, had any one of his old acquaintances on shore but half dreamed of what was lurking in him then, how soon would their aghast and righteous souls have wrenched the ship from such a fiendish man? New York ship owners, the core of the Albany Regency, have brought Jackson to power. They were, quote, bent on profitable cruises, the profits to be counted down in dollars from the mint, unquote. The sponsorship of this Atlantic trade is what had made uh, the, this, this boom in the flush times in, in uh, Alabama and Mississippi in the 1830s. Ishmael learns, though, that crazy Ahab says, <coughs> quote, audacious, immitigable, and supernatural revenge, unquote. Ahab's enemy is a whale, a murderous monster that seems to be everywhere and nowhere, much like the Saltwater Bank of the United States, which provided credit for trade all over the world. In the novel, Ahab uh, nails a piece of gold worth 16 silver dollars to the mast, an echo of the specie circular that sought to nail trade to a new form of gold currency. He has a ship's blacksmith forge a pike lashed out of a hickory stick. On board the ship, a group of crewmen who see the unfolding calamity plan a minor revolt against Ahab. They, were not, they resolve not to call out when the whale surfaces. Much like the newspaper editors who mutinied against Jackson, they refused to point out the lineaments of the monster in front of them. And so the war between Ahab and this monster, this Leviathan, comes to matter more than anything. As Melville well knew, the battle begun between captain and monster in 1832 consumed them all by 1837, driving captain, crew, and whale into oblivion. But while the Bank War of 1832 to 37 helped consolidate Jackson's power and assure Van Buren's election, the depression that followed Van Buren's inauguration in 1837 had torn the party and the country apart. The Democratic Party, like Ahab's ship, was shattered. 1819 was a story of wool jackets, linens, and Osnabergs, and a chain of credit that stretched from the factories of Manchester to the farthest reaches of the West, but it was held together by American flour sold in the profitable Caribbean islands, and it fell apart when Britain's corn laws turned flour into, commodity, into a foreign commodity. Dry foreheads sweated, clean shoes became worn, jackets were patched together for half a decade. A new system of credit, safer than wheat, came in the form of cotton, Grown by slaves, chipped by clipper ships, sold by bales, and guaranteed by notes for future cotton. But a financial institution that gobbled up that trade became immensely powerful. Andrew Jackson was wrong about everything else, but he was right that the Bank of the United States would corrupt one of the few representative governments on the planet. His wild revenge would wreck the state, destroy the trade, and finish a financial system that lashed the labor of five billion slaves to westward expansion. It was a fateful rupture. Without the backing of English banks, the pivot of westward expansion shifted from south to north after 1837. After 1837, credit went not to cotton sellers, but to railroad firms with land grants that could sell five-year mortgages to white Europeans. Not 90-day credit, not that merchant capital that only the wealthiest planters could afford, but five-year credit for immigrants in the states along the Great Lakes. Between 1840 and 1860, free colonies in Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, and Kansas with access to railroad bonded credit spread faster and the population would soon outpace the old slaveholders' frontier. Attempts by Southern congressmen to block that credit network brought Congress to a standstill in the end of the 1850s. A railroad warrior's unwillingness to cede that western territory to slaveholders brought a bloody civil war. Writers are almost always incapable of seeing the privilege that brings their family's fortune, but they are intensely, even obsessively capable of seeing every step when that fortune unravels. Much like Briggs, much like Melville. Briggs and Melville were both hostages, <laughs> hostages to the memories of fortunes that their fathers had lost in the American panics of 1819 and 1837. Briggs's novel shows the consumer credit chain and the relatively inexpensive clothing that made a British empire. That consumer credit stretched all the way over the British empire and even to its former, into its former colonies in the United States. Andrew Jackson, once burned by that system of borrowing, held grudges against English capital. When he became president, he helped build a free trade agreement that allowed the acceleration of settlement into the Southwest 
a producer credit chain that facilitated English credit for raw cotton. But the whale, the second bank, turned a mixed economy in Virginia and South Carolina into a full war, incredibly, increasingly unequal slave regime in the Deep South with even sharper inequalities. When Jackson, the free trader, threatened to break the bank's monopoly, the whale turned back against him. The conflict wrecked both party and nation. By then, the damage had already been done. Tens of thousands of slaves had been sold down the river in the 1830s. Thousands more would cross into Texas after the 1837 panic uh, as to allow slaveholders to escape their debt, which was worse for the South. Uh, the whale itself uh, and its credit were the destruction of the whale and its aftermath. For slaves, the boom of the 1830s broke up thousands of families. The destruction of the ship of state only slowed it down for a decade until slave traders started to trade again on their own capital. Uh, as my student Alex Finley will show, the new method of credit would be the branch banking system of Virginia, North Carolina, and Missouri. The novels of family failings were simultaneously ransom notes that foretold the ugly last scene and attempts to pay the ransom in words. These men could not really see how international debt had made them, but they could well describe every moment when spar, sails, and ship finally sank into the water. It was that record of a failure. It was the story of Louis Day. Thank you. <laughs>
And, and so what's peculiar, what's interesting to me about, there's a couple things that are interesting to me about that. One of them is that consumer credit does seem in some ways to help potentially provision a, a something like a middle class in the, in the West. Um, but the short-term credit, the merchant credit, uh, ends up sharpening these mm -hmm. uh, divides in the Deep South, I think. And, and this is why Louisiana and Mississippi, um, I think in part, are you know, so radically different in some ways in terms of uh, wealth and uh, these other sorts of things than um, you know, Virginia and South Carolina. So that there's, there are two Souths, and the two South have, have a lot, I think, to do with these sort of credit networks. So I guess that's other observation. Yeah. So could you talk more about the railroads and the kind of yeah. change in financing and that? So, and so yeah. Kind of the, and then how that plays into the conflict? Yeah, so Stephen Douglas uh, in 1850 uh, sort of sets up this, this interesting method. And we think about railroads as choo-choos, as trains. But it's really helpful to think about railroads <laughs> as being a mortgage bank. Right. A railroad is a mortgage yeah. bank because it, it's given all this land in the West, the, the land grant railroads are, it's given all this land in the West and then it issues it on five-year mortgages to people who settle in those regions and then it collects that and it uses the money that it collects to pay back bondholders. The bondholders are, are in Europe. So Europeans who've been burned by the Panic of 1837, a lot of the northern banks were very upset, northern banks in the north of England that realize sort of in 1838 that, that a lot of their assets are in uh, you know, slave regimes in the south, reject this. But a lot of private investors start to buy up American railroad bonds because it's a guaranteed method of payment. Because this five-year mortgage seems to be a kind of perfect way. Uh, it's a longer mortgage, but it seems to be a kind of perfect way. And so there's a lot of money that flows to these land to these uh, railroads. Now the first ones are north-south railroads, like Louisville and Nashville, the uh, Illinois Central and others are supposed to go north-south, but they don't get nearly as far as the east-west railroads. So the east-west railroads, they sell many more bonds than the north-south railroads do mm -hmm. and are much more successful. So there are a bunch of uh, land-grant railroads in the south, but they just don't go anywhere. They just they don't, they don't get picked up. Mm -hmm. um, so what it's, what's happening, and this is, this is, I think, the thing that's hard to see, is it's a securitization of mortgages. It's taking mortgages and bundling up the, the securities mm -hmm. and selling them in Britain uh, f for people to get this sort of long-term payoff. So very much like you know, the, the last uh, debt crisis. Right. And what this does, all this money does, is it makes it easier to settle the West because people can buy, you can actually buy 100 acres or 50 acres of land, uh, well, it's not, but you can buy some, you know, more than 50 acres of land in um, Britain, right, or in, uh, in Hamburg, and it's included in the ticket price for your travel over and oh, wow. yeah, <laughs> and so you get, uh, and then you pay off the mortgage and the ticket right. over time. And so it's an excellent way of kind of sucking people out of Northern Europe and settling them into the Midwest, which mm -hmm. is what happens in the 40s and 50s, particularly in Japan, Germany, but also in, in, in England. Yeah. And, and, um, and so what that does is it makes those Northern states much more populous, much more quickly because right. of this, because of the securitization. And it's the group called the F Street Maps, this group of white Southerners that puts a stop to that. Uh, um, in, uh, this, I talk about this, 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 something called the Swamp Act of 1857, which um, basically calls into question all these, a bunch of these mortgages. Mm -hmm. When that happens, a bunch of British people dump their bonds. When that happens, you see the Panic of 1857. And that's when James Henry Hammond comes along and says, Cotton is king. Yeah. Look, you know, the cotton regime is fine, but what he's really saying, another way of saying this is, Cotton has gotten no credit from 1837 to 1857. Now we should get credit because look, this whole northern uh, system has has collapsed around you. So that's mm -hmm. that's sort of what um, the what's what's happening here in, in kind of broad strokes is a, a lot of capital that's flowing into the settlement of folks into um, land in Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And those people don't want to give up. They don't want to let the southern slave regimes then move into those areas. Right. They don't. Yeah. Right. 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 And they yeah. And they they want to settle in regions. I mean, for for not just because they don't want southern slave owners there, because they don't want black people there too. I mean, it's you know, it's a it's a complicated right. dynamic. Right. Uh, but um, but yeah. And so that's that. Um, so as capital flows to there, people right. flow too. Uh, right. Kind of in the wake of it almost. And also brought the brought all the immigrants who then fought in the army. Right. Right. 
right. those Midwesterners who you know end up winning the war. But yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. There's all these German, uh, right. you know, folks who German and Scandinavians. German and Scandinavians. Yeah. Other observations. Sorry, it's a lot of th stuff thrown together <laughs> in a very so sprawling. Let's hike by a Volvo now. What's that? It's, same, it's hiking by a Volvo now. Let's go oh right, you go over. Right? Yeah. You yeah. Go yeah. Over. need a ticket. You go no. and you buy a Volvo. You pick it up. And, and it's built into the ticket price. I'm right. sure. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of a lot of what you said about the ticket price is, is very incredibly true after the Civil War. You get an awful lot of the land grant uh, railroads that provide the tickets right. and, and the steamship lines and they're all yeah. tied together yeah. with recruiters in Europe. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask or make a comment or observation. It's a little hard to figure out exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Um, but in the in the eighteen fifties, railroads in the South are still slightly recovering from the Panic of 1837, right. that, that that panic is so much deeper in the South than elsewhere because cotton is a central feature right. of the panic, that, that Southern investors feel that they got burned right. significantly because of all the failure of the railroads in the 1840s, and then those that did survive didn't get finished until you know the Western Atlantic of, of, of the state of Georgia didn't get right. finished until 1851, 52, right, uh, right in there. So, in, in many ways, they're not poised to take advantage of right. the kind of credit system you've described for the railroads, and that that would then give them the reason to have the backlash of against the federal government's effectively subsidizing the northern economy. Right. Through this, now, like I said, I don't know if I'm asking a question or if I'm, if I'm making a comment. <laughs> um, right. But in any event, uh, could you comment on, on on whatever it was I just said? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, uh, what there is, uh, we have this, we have this idea that there's a lot of there's lots of fear in the in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, and that this is the free banking era, and and it's there's a lot of state subsidy of railroads that happens particularly in the south, uh, more so in the south than in the north. And so, and this process of hypothecation is basically where states sell bonds to support railroads. They're effectively guaranteeing, uh, they, the states sell state bonds, they buy railroad stock. Um, the states are effectively half owners of most of these southern railroads. Um, and the railroads don't, there's not, I'm not, you know, the ones that succeed are the ones that go into cotton fields and exit at ports, uh, like the Western, uh, um, well, like uh, da, 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 da. the, the um, South Carolina Railroad is one that's that's like that. The, um, Central Georgia. Central Georgia is one that's like that. So, so those are successful. But there are a lot of other ambitious projects that Jefferson Davis is involved in and uh, the Mortar Keys and North Carolina Railroad, all these other sorts of things that just never quite make it. In part, the North Carolina Railroad seems like a good idea, but it's, uh, but the port of, you know, the port of Wilmington is not an especially uh, you know, bustling port. It's not entirely clear what's gonna go in and what's gonna go back uh, when, when it's established. And North Carolina, because North Carolina is such a big, uh, you know, in, in investor in it, it's this long, it passes through as many counties in North Carolina as you, as you can get. So, so uh, the fact that it's public, the state public subsidies are, are relatively high it makes them also somewhat less uh, effective. And there's not a system of mortgages with those either. So they don't, so there's no, there's no land that they have access to that they can, that's given them by the federal government that they can then mortgage out. Whereas in these Northwestern territories, that does work. But like, oh, I don't know, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, places like that where you should see like the Ship Island Railroad, the Gulf and Ship Island Railroad and things like that, they don't, uh, there just aren't enough takers, I think, in the, the land that, they have, that the Gulf and Ship Island and these other railroads are promising uh, to make it uh, worth anyone's while, and, and settlers don't want to go to um, the, the Deep South. So I think that's, but you're right, it's, it's a very complicated story, and, and probably it's the South's recovery, you know, weakened recovery from 1837, that means that there's just not the uh, infrastructure. The fact that, the, the I do tell this other story uh, about 1837, though, in, the, in this Nation of Deadbeats book, uh, which this is partly drawn from, and that is that in 1837, there is this financial panic, and what a lot of states do is sort of what Greece and Italy did after the 2008 downturn, which is to issue lots and lots of debt to try to cover the, uh, that failure and in 1842, so five years after the panic, uh, just like 
uh, we saw five years after 2008, uh, the bills start to come due and it becomes clear that the southern states can't pay those bills. So um, there's 11 state defaults, uh, most of them in the south, uh, many of them in the south, a few up, uh, up north as well, uh, in 1842. Um, and the, the story I like to tell about this, and so there is a kind of shadow of the panic that, that hurts the South especially badly, although it also hits uh, Illinois and a couple of other places. But Jefferson Davis uh, in 1843 backs up uh, McNutt of Mississippi and says, you know, we're not gonna pay these debts back. We're never gonna pay them. We're gonna repudiate these debts. Um, you know, we, we don't have to pay them. They're Jews that hold these bonds. We're not gonna hold, that's what McNutt says. Um, that's, that's in 1842. In 1861, when the Confederacy uh, is going to Europe to uh, try to negotiate bonds uh, and try to buy, you know, get people to, to buy these Confederate bonds, um, you know, Rothschild says, I know every man of capital in Europe and they're not going to lend your Confederacy a red cent or something. It's worse to that effect. But this, that defaults in the South in 1842, ultimately, I think, doom the Confederacy because the Confederacy can't get the capital that it needs to fight to fight that war. So, so they call it, uh, so there, there are these, these pieces by uh, Bigelow, who's a sort of agent of, of the Republican Party in, in uh, Britain, and he calls them uh, Jefferson Davis repudiator in chief. Uh, and these are the messages from Jefferson Davis repudiator in chief. Uh, and as you can imagine, this, uh, so the earlier loan happens, but the other loans that, are, that try to float just get nowhere, uh, partly for that reason. So there is, there is this default, this kind of state defaults that happen uh, after the 37th panic on the south is especially uh, hobbled by the other. Scott, thank you very thank much. You. That was very good.